done by PowerPoint. I've never discovered how to use PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I would just talk. So uh, my work is in microarchitecture. Microarchitecture is within the spectrum of activity that you're all familiar with, which is using a computer. Uh, you describe problems in natural language, you know, English, French, German, Chinese, Japanese, etc. Uh, the computer can't understand those languages, so you have to get the problem to a point uh, where the computer can understand it. What really does the work is actually the electrons that go from one voltage potential to another, and you have to transform that problem from natural language to a thing we call an algorithm, which gets rid of all the ugliness of natural language. Natural language is quite ugly. Uh, the same word has multiple meanings depending on context. Computers don't get context. They only can interpret something that is uniquely uh, interpretable. So if it has more than one meaning, the meaning the computer doesn't know what to do. From the algorithm, we program in some mechanical language. And there are more than a thousand mechanical languages in use. And from that program, which Many of you have programmed C, C++. Python seems to be the favorite language of choice today. In the old days, Fortran, COBOL. Uh, almost any, I don't know, some people suggested Java as a language. I've always thought Java was more of a religion. High priests, et cetera. For the language we translated to the zeros and ones, that the computer can sort of understand, not really. The computer is really not an electronic genius, it's an electronic idiot. It does exactly what you tell it to do, not what you want it to do. If you want it to do something and you don't tell, tell it precisely that, it doesn't do it. So we translate from that high level language that I just mentioned, the half a dozen of the thousands that exist, to zeros and ones, and then I come in and I look at those zeros and ones, and I know what the underlying circuits provide. And knowing what the circuits provide, I can figure out a way to make those zeros and ones carry out their job a lot faster than they used to. Uh, some people have suggested that if you look at the, uh, the history, in fact, before I do that, I should probably uh, uh, show you uh, this. In fact, I could pick on a student, but I'd rather pick on a professor. You know what this is? No idea. See that? See, if I asked a student, he'd know every time. He would know that this is a keychain. <laughs> <laughs> Intel, the company that makes this chip, uh, believes that 100% of their chip should work. Okay? We call it 100% yield of the uh, fabrication process. And in fact, 100% do work. Some of them work having passed the electronic tests and put into laptops in the actual process. Others work by being put into keychains so they can show people. But every one of these things has, has a use. This thing came out, this is old actually, 1992. And it's only got 3 million transistors on it. So when in 1992 I could only work with 3 million transistors. Uh, the first microprocessor was 1971. It only had 2300 transistors. 2.3 thousand. 1992, 20 years later, 3.1 million. Today it's more than 5 billion. The frequency at which this, these uh, chips run at, that is the individual unit of time in which processing takes place. In, uh, well, we got lights up there, and you all know that these lights go on and off. It's kind of hard to see them going on and off. But they do, 60 times a second. We call it 60 hertz. In 1971, when we had the first microprocessor with 2.3 thousand transistors on it, it went on and off 100,000 times a second. And then this chip here, if it worked, it doesn't, that's why it's a keychain. It would go on and off six, uh, 66 million times a second. Today, it goes on and off three point something billion times a second. In fact, if I asked you, you have a laptop, what frequency does it run at? 
you might say 2.8 gigahertz. That means 2.8 billion times a second. So this electronic idiot <coughs> is going, is operating in units of time that are so tiny, you can get an enormous amount of stuff done. And there are so many transistors, there's a lot of stuff that can get done at the same time. I'm a microarchitect. My job is to harness this technology. Uh, the, the people have said the analogy is something like if the um, transportation industry uh, was as good as we are, you'd be able to load 500 people on an airplane that was about this big and uh, fly those 500 people from here to Japan in half a second on a uh, thimble full of gasoline or something. That's the equivalent uh, development we've done in technology. And my job is to use that technology to make things go uh, faster and faster. <clears throat> the way I do it, which is uh, you know by doing research, and I probably ought to, this is an engineering group, so uh, I should quote you the, uh, I guess it was Von Kerman that uh, first said it, that uh, the difference between science and engineering. Science explains what is, engineering creates what never was. That's what we do, we create what never was. Now, how do we do it? Well, we do it by doing research. And I guess I should say something about uh, what doing research is all about, because, in fact, uh, the professor mentioned that, uh, in fact, how did she say it? Uh, you look at this experiment, it was pretty simple, you know? You didn't think that, you know, piece of cake. And it never is. It always takes far longer than it does. Uh, research is a job not suited to everybody. You uh, work all day, and at the end of the day, you probably have nothing uh, to show for it. And so then you come back and work the next day. And again, you have nothing to show for it. In fact, I've often thought of uh, at the end of each day, not the end of the day, you know, the, uh, uh, the you know, figuratively the end of the day, but at the end of each day. Uh, I thought of taking my graduate students, my PhD students, and taking them out in the backyard and handing them a shovel and say, okay, dig a hole. Why would I make my PhD students dig a hole in the ground at the end of the day? So that he could see that he accomplished something. <laughs> <laughs> because in research, at the end of the day, you don't know see that he accomplished something. And then the next day, I take them back down and what would I do then? Fill in the hole, that's right. So then you can see the accomplishment. Fill in the hole. But every so often, it hits you, you know? And when it does, there is no feeling like it. Trust me. Uh, the heart starts to pound. You're uncovering new knowledge. You see something that nobody ever saw before. And it's incredible. And it happens when you least expect it. It's when you get lucky. Research is all about being lucky. And what is luck? Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. So if you didn't do this every day, do and do and do and have nothing to show at the end of the day, if you hadn't done that, when that thing happened, when that opportunity flew by, you wouldn't recognize it. Just sail over your head. So, a few words if you're interested in the research career. Research is not being successful every day. But when you are, I can remember the, it doesn't happen very often. I will give you one example of something I've done uh, when I get through with this rant. Uh, <laughs> but the rant is important. That uh, if you're expecting to be successful every day, then research is not for you. But when it does happen, when and it can happen at the weirdest of moments. It can happen in the shower. It can happen as you're driving along. It can happen, you know, in the middle of a, uh, you're playing a pickup game of basketball or something, and all of a sudden, bingo, you just, you just see it, you know, and you rush and you sit down and you write. And uh, the heart pounds like it never has before. Uh, I can remember one, uh, one time when, uh, I sat down at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and I started working and the things were happening and the heart pounds and it was noon the next day when I put my pen down that I had solved the problem that nobody had ever been able to solve before. 
So when it does happen, and it may not even happen that many times in a career, but when it does happen, wow, it's, it's, it all becomes worthwhile. So my research, and I suppose I should spend a minute or so on that at least, uh, <laughs> is harnessing this, these billions of transistors that are now on the chip in order to make things happen as you're surfing the web or solving some problem. In fact, you know, you type in the input data and you hit the uh, enter key and before you know it, the answer is on the screen. Well, if you did this 20 years ago, you could hit the button and then go out and get a cup of coffee and come back and say, oh, it's not there yet, go have dinner, come back, maybe do that pickup game of basketball, come back and eventually maybe you have the answer. And in fact, getting the answer much, much faster um, could produce the ability to solve some important problems. I used to have a slide when I, I would do these uh, talks with what do I think the computer's going to be able to do. And I had uh, three, three items. And the first item I would say was, uh, well, it's going to be able to drive a car, so you don't have to get behind the wheel of the car again. And we've already seen that that's already there. That is absolutely Google. Right now, the technology is there. We, if we get the price down, we get the liability figured out, we, we be there. In fact, my prediction is 10 years from now, you won't be allowed to drive. It's you know, it's too dangerous for that person behind the wheel. You know, all be done. But we've got to get the economics right. We've got to get the, uh, uh, the liability <coughs> uh, right. That used to be my first bullet. My third bullet used to be our cognition. That is say, uh, computer, you know, write a paper. You know, something, something, something where you're creating, we're not there yet, and we're not going to be there for a while. Uh, there's a lot of quacks out there that will complain, that will claim uh, that the computer can do anything that human can do. That's not true. Computers do what we tell us to do. Uh, it may be that someday in the future, don't underestimate the ingenuity of people. Uh, maybe someday in the future, Future, we understand how the brain works well enough to understand how cognition works, how human brains really do do what they do, making progress at it. There's a lot of uh, make-believe going on where we're uh, looking at the neuron and saying, ah, this neuron with its dendrites and its axon, that kind of looks like a threshold logic unit. You may not know what a threshold logic unit, but for years, people looked at a threshold logic unit as a logical gate you probably know about AND gates and OR gates. Special logic gate. So now it looks like a neuron. And when you get a pesticide threshold, it fires. You say, wow, I can, I can uh, model the brain. Most of that stuff is nonsense as far as modeling the brain. Uh, machine learning is a very popular thing these days. Uh, more nonsense. Machine isn't learning. What the machine is doing is uh, statistical patterning. But because there's so much, there are so many transistors out there, and there is so such a short interval of time when, a, uh, when processing goes on, and you multiply that by billions of intervals of time per second, it appears that the computer is learning. No, it's just examining huge numbers of samples and passing hyperplanes in such a way that we can draw inferences but those inferences are a long way from what a uh, human could be. In fact, there was a colleague, Danny Hillis. In fact, his, his brother is on the faculty in biology here at Perry QT. Brilliant family, his mother must be very proud. Uh, Danny Hillis invented a thing he called the thinking machine, uh, PhD at MIT in the mid-80s. And he said, why is it that um, the computer has something like 10 to the 9th cells, and it switch, switches in the nanosecond range, which means 10 to the 9th switches per second, and 10 to the 9th times 10 to the 9th is 10 to the 18th. And the human has something like 10 to the 10th neurons, and they switch in the millisecond range. So 10 to the 10 times 10 to the 3 is 10 to the 13th. So the human works at 10 to the 13, and the computer works at 10 to the 18, and yet the human can pick up things that the 
the computer you can't pick up at all. Uh, I talked about driving the car. When you're driving, let's say you're driving in New York City, Times Square, and there's a red light. The human will pick out that red light every time. The computer won't, because there's lots of stuff that the computer can see as the red light. <coughs> and yet the computer has five orders of magnitude more switches per second than the human does. It has to do with human cognition, and we're a long way from understanding what is done to a point where we can make the computer uh, do it. Okay, my research. So where, where am I? So I'm trying to make the computer go faster. So how do we do that? Well, the thing that people give me the most credit for, it's not my best piece of work, but it's the easiest piece of work for people to understand, so they all talk about it. <laughs> uh, what computers do is execute programs. And the program is a sequential sequence uh, it's a sequential set of instructions. You do this, then you do this, then you do this, and you do them in order. And somebody a long time ago said, you know, if that's true, you do them in order. And if each instruction, and for those of you that double E's and had to suffer through my freshman course, or at least freshman textbook with some other professor, you know that each instruction goes through several stages from the time you Go get the instruction to the time you finish the work. And somebody a long time ago says, well, why don't we make an assembly line? We don't call it an assembly line, we call it a pipeline. And what we'll do is we'll have all these pieces of logic, and the first piece will just get the instruction and hand it off. And while the next piece is figuring out what has to be done, <coughs> this piece will go get the next instruction and hand it off. And it's an assembly line. I don't know whether you've ever been in a factory. I remember when I was 10 years old at the Ford Motor Factory. And they had an assembly line, 60 mechanics, each one working for two minutes. <coughs> and the base chassis would come on the assembly line. Two hours later, the car would be driven off the assembly line. But if you were standing there, what you would see was every two minutes. You'd say, wow, it takes two minutes to assemble a Ford. First time I told that, somebody said, Ah, yeah, I own a Ford. I can believe it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't take two minutes. It's this assembly line that is allowing much faster stuff. But the way a program works is you do this, then this, do this. And then you do what is called a conditional branch, which means either do this or go over there and do that. And if it's an assembly line, we base either do this or go over and do that on the basis of what we just did. But if it's an assembly line, what we just did hasn't reached the end. In fact, it's only at the next mechanic, at the time we want to bring in the next piece. So what do we do? We can wait the two hours until it gets all the way to the end, or we can guess. And my branch predictor guesses uh, which way we go. I guess it was what, that great philosopher, probably the greatest philosopher of the 20th century, I uh, just died uh, recently. You know, he used to catch the New York Yankees. And he says, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Yeah, so that's what a branch is. You come to a fork in the road, which way do you go? <coughs> now, if, you got, if you're a guy, you just go. <laughs> and then 20 minutes later, your friend sitting next to you said, nah, we went the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a woman, you probably have more brains. You stop the car and you look at the map. And then you go and you don't have to retract the steps. But, you know, be Tarzan, guys. Maps. You just go. You know. If you can guess most of the time correctly, then it's worth going. Uh, it turns out that because the assembly line is so long, if you guess wrong, you throw a huge amount of work away. In fact, before I came along, the best guessers we're guessing with accuracy 80%. Dreadful. And then I came along and I, my guesser, I don't call it guesser because you don't get paid the high bucks if you get a guesser. Predictor. My predictor guessed 97% of the time. Now there are researchers, actually I'm not the big deal anymore. The big deal today is a guy named Andre Sesnek at India in uh, Rennes in, uh, in France. 
His guess sir, is correct 98% of the time. He's much better than me. You say, much better, 98? You said you were at 77. That's right. All this work, I have to throw away 3% of the time. You only have to throw away 2% of the time. That's a big deal. That allows the program to <coughs> compute, to do its job much, much faster. So how do I guess? And why is it important to guess? And I'll throw that in first, and I'll tell you how I guess. It's important to guess, I told you about the self-driving car, and that's a done deal. Ten years from now, no license for you. And I told you about the computer that can think, and that may happen, but I don't hold out any hope for it happening anytime soon. But there's a thing in the middle, and that's where I hold out the hope for it, what keeps me going with doing the search. Even though those of you who are in my classroom know I prefer to be in the classroom teaching than doing the search, but I really like both. And I really insist that our university is a world-class university, not a world-class research university. It's a world-class university, teaching and research both. The research I do is because of that thing in the middle. Wouldn't it be great if we had a program that could predict the tsunami in 10 minutes? The tsunami is going to hit tomorrow. Right now we can predict the tsunami will hit two weeks from now. You know, is what I said that wrong. We can predict the tsunami will hit tomorrow, but we'll get the answer of our prediction two weeks from now. Doesn't do any good. It hit tomorrow, two weeks from now, in fact, tomorrow evening, we can just look at the devastation. We don't need to wait for the program to work. Cure cancer. How long does it take to run that program to cure cancer? How about if we can do that before the patient dies? So there are these problems out there and those are my two favorite examples, cure cancer predicts tsunamis, that if we could get the computer to run a lot faster than it can run today, we have a shot at getting the, the <coughs> program to execute and give us the result in time for it to do some good. So one of the things I do the branch predictor. So before I came on, the prediction was based on what happened before. So supposing I told you the last time I saw a branch, it was taken. <coughs> that is, you don't do the next thing, you go someplace else. When you see this branch instruction in the language of the computer, you know if it doesn't do the next thing, it tells you where to find the next thing. So you have in front of you, as you bring in that instruction, those two choices. Bring in the next thing, which is located sequentially in the next location, or use those zeros and ones of the instruction to tell you where to go. But your job is, do you go there and get that one, or you just do the next one? And that's the thing you bring into the assembly line, next cycle. And supposing I told you the last time it said go there, and the time before that it said do the next thing, and the time before that it said go there, and the time before that it said do the next thing. So let me say go there, I'll call that one and do the next thing, I'll call that zero. And if I told you the pattern was one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, what would you do next? Zero. You've got a nice periodic thing going for you. And on those, the branch predictors work terrific. But what if I told you the pattern was one, one, zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero. What do I want to do next? You have no idea. And so the computer would always, not always, but often enough, get it wrong. And one day I was just driving back from playing a pickup game of basketball, and all of a sudden it just hit me. And I said, wait a minute. How about if we keep track of what did it do the last time its history was this pattern? Let me give you a simple example of a pattern. Let's say it was 111 one, one. And I say, what was the last time it was one, 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 zero, 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 one, one. What did it do then? It was taken. And how about the last time that it had that exact history? What did it do then? It was taken. And the time before that when it had that history, it was taken. And now it has that history. What should we do? Take it. That's the brilliant result that before me, 
nobody did. It's an indirect, it's a two-level prediction. You're not looking at what happened, you're looking at what happened the last time this was my history of what happened. It requires that second level, that level of indirection. Uh, how, did it ha how did I figure it out? I don't know. I was struggling with the problem, I would try all kinds of experiments, and then all of a sudden bingo would hit me, and we went from 80%, which was the best predicted before that, to 97% using my mechanism. And today, uh, every uh, high performance microprocessor out there, actually even the low performance microprocessors, most of them use my two of them. And that's just one example. There are so many places in computer technology uh, where things are not done as good as they could be done, that if we can wrap our brain around it, we work, we get nowhere, we dig the hole with the shovel, we get nowhere, and then all of a sudden it hits, and things get better as a result because we created something from nothing. So, that's about all I have.